Okay, good evening everyone and welcome to the Open Web Application Security Project uh, London Chapter Meeting. Um, my name is uh, Sam Stakanyan, I'm one of your chapter leaders. My colleague Sharif Mansour is just over here uh, handling the video camera. This is our fourth meeting this year. Um, we try to run these meetings every two months, so we're planning the next one to be two months from now. Um, here's the agenda for tonight. So uh, I hope you all had the pizza and beer. I think there's some left over there, and I think that you get a chance to get some more during the break. Um, so I'm going to have a very short welcome talk and uh, give you an update on what OWASP is and uh, the latest OWASP news and updates on some projects. Um, then we're going to have um, a lightning talk from Nick and uh, Ken and Andrew are going to show us how to hack the thermostat. It's going to be a very interesting talk. So uh, those of you who watch Mr. Robot probably spotted the Mr. Robot music as an intro that I played. There will be more of that to come related to this. Um, because the theme for tonight is uh, um, not just cyber security. <laughs> I think it's it's a bit serious. Uh, and I think Khalid kind of said the set the theme for, uh, for, uh, for uh, this evening um, uh, with his cyber terrorism talk. And we can see um, not just the educational side of security, but also a bit more serious side of security. <laughs> and uh, then we're going to have a break and more beer and pizza, uh, after which we're going to have another lightning talk and Chris is going to show us uh, that random numbers are not that common, and uh, probably you shouldn't base your security on randomness, uh, or on some random numbers. <laughs> Okay, uh, and then after that, Dennis is going to talk to us about Node.js and how you can use tests and uh, a bit of uh, uh, Node.js hacking with uh, our new uh, OWASP project uh, called Juice Shop. And then we're going to move to a pub across the road where we can continue till 11 p.m. our beer networking for those of you who can stay here. Okay, so um, as I said, my name is Sam, this is Sharif, we're your chapter leaders. And uh, those of you who are here for the first time, you know, you can keep in touch with us by uh, Twitter. Um, you can also join our mailing list, which is the best way. This is a very low volume mailing list. We only send out emails when there's an announcement about the next event coming. So I, I suggest you uh, join the list. Um, also, we've got a Facebook page that you can like, and we publish the events there. Um, also, we now get a YouTube channel because Sharif is kindly videoing all the events. So um, if you'd like to watch the presentations again and again, you get a chance to do that, and obviously, as I said, not everyone can be here tonight, and uh, if you have colleagues or friends who might be interested, you can tell them you couldn't attend the event, you can watch the videos, and uh, uh, everything's available for free. And there's now one more channel for uh, you to talk to us, for those of you who are developers and you are on Slack, and I have a Chapter London channel on Slack, and that's a thing called OWASP, that uh, you can join and chat to us. Okay, uh, so um, briefly about OWASP, so we are a non-profit foundation, uh, we are all volunteers, everything we do is for free, our speakers are here, also presented for free, uh, I think it's quite important, we are completely vendor neutral, even though we have speakers who are coming from the vendors, but this is all about security, and uh, our aim is to make our world more secure, and uh, uh, you can become a member, so membership in OWASP costs for individuals only 50 US dollars a year. And uh, that's not just a donation, that also gives you a discount to quite a lot of uh, info security events, including uh, application security, Europe Application Security USA. Uh, actually, there's Application Security USA coming up, there will be a slide on that. There's also corporate membership, so uh, corporations, organizations, they can contribute and um, um, sponsor us as well and help all of us run these events and help us with our projects, help us produce our standards and guidance and of course uh, um, uh, help us to write some tools as some of you might know, all of us also produces a lot of tool security tools and they're all absolutely free and they're open source and you can just go and download from all of us website so um, these companies uh, on screen at the moment, they are, these are our sponsors and uh, uh, some organizations are 
our hosting sponsor, so you can see Skype where we are today. So many thanks to Skype for providing this wonderful facility. Um, it's uh, one of our sponsors. As I said previously, those of you who well, attended the previous meeting, which was at Expedia, um, you know that Expedia provided a wonderful um, conference space for us as well last time. Um, if you see your logo somewhere here, or you see a familiar logo on the screen, these are all the organizations who sponsor OWAS. And so corporate sponsorship starts from about, I think, 200,000 US dollars a year as well. So if you'd like to sponsor us, uh, there are various levels of sponsorship that uh, you can check on our website. And there are a few companies which are premier sponsors, which means they contribute a lot of money. Uh, Adobe, Contrast, HP, Qualys, and Salesforce. Okay, so um, those of you who travel to US or from US or can get to US in a few weeks, there is a massive conference happening called AppSec USA. It's in Washington, D.C., so it's a bit of a shorter flight compared to New, um, Los Angeles or Seattle or wherever. So um, um, if you can attend, I urge you to attend. Those of you who are OWAS members will get a massive discount, up to 50% off uh, for registration fee. So that's happening in Washington, D.C. Another big news, this year Black Hat Europe is in London, for those of you who don't know. So that is happening at this place, Business Design Center, the Angel. Okay, so um, uh, it's fantastic news for all, all, all the hackers, fantastic developers, and everyone registered, uh, interested in cybersecurity. Uh, it's not a cheap conference, it's quite expensive. Uh, the reason why I got it on the screen, not just for awareness, but because there will be almost projects showcased um, during Black Hat Europe. I'm going to briefly talk about these projects. So one project is always Jude Shop. Uh, Dennis, when he arrives, uh, will talk about this project. So this is a um, vulnerable Node.js and JavaScript application. So those of you who are us, you can actually play with that and see all the vulnerabilities in it. Um, another project presented will be um, almost Caesar of Guard. Okay. So this is not a new project, it's quite old. Our one has been updated recently, and there will be a Black Hat talk on this. Um, there will be also a talk on this project, I'm not sure how you will know about this, the SSL DLS scanner called Deep Violet. I urge you to check it out if you need to check the strength of your SSL security. Um, this project is also very, very cool, ZSC. So that project allows you to generate shell cards and uh, do some very interesting hacking and achieving remote shell to your service and uh, hack corporations remotely. Um, very cool tool. Okay, uh, our flagship tool, of course, is uh, OWASP Zap, our vulnerability scanner. Uh, that will be presented at Black Hat as well. And we recently done quite an interesting integration piece with Zap, which um, uh, Sharif actually um, uh, contributed uh, with an intent. So I'll show you a slide of what it is. It's all open source, now available. Zap, so Sharif, do you want to just give a quick presentation of what it is? Yeah, so, um, thanks Sam. So, <clears throat> over the summer, what we had done is we contributed some code for uh, the Zap project in order to be able to make it um, easier to integrate into SDLCs, and especially if you're doing, any of your developers are doing continuous integration. So essentially what we've done is we've created two modules. The first one essentially um, sets up Zap and the API communication, and the other one does the scanner settings. And what you can do is run the regression pack into it. It actually can actually um, send reports into bug trackers like um, uh, um, Jira, and also you can decide the amount of time, for example, if you want to do a spider, how long it will take, how long the active scans will last, and also it can you can decide which uh, types of security vulnerabilities will pass, fail, or which ones you want to ignore as well, if they're uh, causing a lot of false positives. Uh, but the, all the information is here, you can see the, the MD file is actually quite more verbose, but um, also if you want to know more about it, uh, come see me afterwards. Thanks, Drew. Right. Um, okay, I think we're now uh, almost ready for our main speakers. I think you can see that. Um, um, so we, the first talk is a lightning talk. Um, so uh, uh, Khalid here 
Um, is a big contributor to internet. So those of you who know what um, IANA or IGF, Internet Governance Forum, is, um, that's uh, um, very big international entities that kind of contributed. Also, um, those of you who do not speak, well, English is not the first language, and you need to write something using a script which is not Latin, uh, might know that there's something called IDM, or Internationalized Domain Names. This is where you can write website names in your browser using Arabic, or Cyrillic, or Armenian. That's where I'm from. It's a different script. It, it, uh, it now works in all browsers. And it took a lot of effort to internationalize internet, so that's actually partially Khalid's effort to uh, make all this work. But also recently, Khalid's been uh, uh, investigating and researching the interesting aspect of cyber terrorism. So the first talk is about cyber terrorism tonight. And yeah, without further ado, I'm just going to start the presentation and Khalid stuff. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. So, thank you. Thank you, everybody. Um, by the way, uh, with all of the contributions we've done on making the Global Internet multilingual for the last 20 plus years, um, I think somebody else came in and with his little finger, he truly democratized the internet. And I think his, well, his name is uh, Steve Jobs. And uh, by creating apps, he truly revolutionized the internet. Ten years ago, we were under a billion internet users. It was actually a, an English internet deployed globally. Uh, today, uh, we have more than 3.5 billion internet users, and that's thanks to him, so I won't take all the credit. Thank you very much. Um, first of all, um, <clears throat> the title might uh, confuse many of you, and uh, not surprisingly. Uh, incidentally, in all the audience here, who is, uh, who is not technical, raise your hand. Wow, 1%, <laughs> half a percent. Um, if you're thinking you're going to get a technical uh, talk here today, well, guess what? You're in for a shock. Can your organization survive a poly cyber breach? And your first question is let's see if I can make this work. What is poly cyber? Well, poly cyber, by definition, is cyber attacks perpetrated or inspired by extremist organization groups like ISIS, Daesh, and rogue states. Now, if any of you have, what, have witnessed what they've been doing in the traditional sense, many of you may already know about what they've been doing in the cyberspace as well. And the potential is potentially catastrophic. So, this is not looking good, but anyway, what's the key difference between conventional threats and polycyber? Okay, well, let's put it in a nutshell. Polycyber. Let me start with the conventional. Conventional is everything we've been seeing under the sun for years. So from the kids who hacked, uh, well, let me get to the scaremongering in a moment. <laughs> so from the kids who actually hacked TalkTalk, Talk, who came into play, to those who are coming in for ransomware, from uh, the uh, uh, credit card, to industrial espionage, even when the Chinese and the Americans hack each other, we treat this as conventional. Fundamental reason is, and that's where the differentiation from polycyber is, the objective is not to destroy the target, it's something else. The minute you get into polycyber and the motivation, which is the key component, if I can get that to show up, motivation. The key component of what motivates the polycyber hacker and that's different from the conventional threat, is they want to cause maximum damage to the target or destruction of it for publicity, for recruitment drive, and to show that they are there to be reckoned with. So is it making sense to everybody? Raise your hand if it's making sense. Okay, all right, good. Good audience, fantastic. Now, why this is critical? First of all, when we talk about cyber threats and, and, and cyber terrorism, or even terrorism in general. A lot of people say, well, you're scaremongering. Well, you may be scaremongering, but you know, if you can validate what, your threat, what the threats are, you're not scaremongering, you're educating, and it's only by education where people will make a difference in doing the right thing. So, 
So if you think we're scaremongering, this is what the experts, what experts and the media have reported. Anybody knows who this face is? Anybody raise your hand? Who's that? Huh? Actually, no. This is uh, the chief of the GCHQ, Hannigan. So that's the, uh, the, the the chief of the, uh, the chief expert in the UK. Why this is relevant? This is June 19, uh, 2016. Terrorist groups acquiring cyber capability to bring major cities to a standstill. Warns chief of GCHQ. Journalist Abdelbari Atwan is the gentleman who actually interviewed Osama bin Laden in 1996. In his book, The Digital Caliphate, he's, he writes, Cyber Caliphate Division has that successfully attacked the U.S. government central command. Successfully, that's the key word. So, another thing from, uh, from uh, Hannigan. Determined hackers can get in, they can cause damage. Can the business or the public keep going? You know where I'm going with this, by the way? And the head of NATO, look what he said. The threat landscape is vast, from malware, activists to organized criminals and state-sponsored attacks, things that we thought impossible can be done. Are we short on time? Yeah. Okay, I'll wrap it up. So, in a nutshell, these are all examples of what's been deployed in the public domain. But the truth of the matter here is, Decision makers, your bosses, are still net getting that their survivability is at stake. So when these people do hack, and it all depends on how determined they are, they're not coming into play. So in time, and some of this stuff has already happened, but we haven't seen it in the public domain yet, but in time what you'll start seeing, organizations getting breached, and some of them are huge, and they may not survive. And you know what's not gonna make them survive? It's not the hacker. This is not a nuclear bomb that will blow you up to smithereens. The damage they will cause to reputation and the damage they will cause to trust in the users to come back to that particular company is what the market will do to actually gobble it up. So, at least this is really putting this in perspective and the presentation will be posted, uh, Sam. You can use it. Talk Talk, for example, another case study. We put a conservative estimate of Talk Talk, hard cost of that damage in excess of a quarter of a billion pounds, by the way. Kids did this, and they were not poly cyber hackers. Imagine the same opportunity you give for somebody with a different motivation. What would they do to your organization? So, the last question to ask ourselves is oh, this, this is interesting, by the way. Who's heard about Ashley Madison? Raise your hand. Would any of you go and register and uh, become a client of Ashley Madison and really wanted a bit of uh, fun time anymore? No. This is what we call, this is conventional threat, damaged, and as a matter of fact, there have been suicides as a result of this. This is a dead man walking. This is an organization already, chapter 11, written all over it. And this is conventional threats, not even polycidal. So if anybody thinks that uh, we're still talking about a million here, a million there, guess what? Wake up and smell the coffee. Go and tell your bosses survivability are at stake. Last but not least, so with all this, our chairman, CEOs, and, and board level uh, uh, decision makers listening, well, the information is out there. And what's making them not listen is we're still talking about the same old stuff. When you tell a decision maker who's not technical about cyber security, what do they do? Raise your hand. They just tell you, talk to my experts. Is that, is that not correct? Because they don't understand it. The solution is you have to really make them think that this is about continuity of your business. Otherwise, you're gonna get annihilated. On our last note, I thank you. And if you have any questions, feel free to ask me, but later on, I'll be around. Thank you very much.